You're listening to the WADT podcast, and um, today we'll be talking about a very interesting subject. Now, the perfect child, if there's such a thing in most parents' minds, is a well behaved and obedient one who also does well in school. Now, driven by this vision, parents have resorted to a number of methods to have a perfect child. Now, with me today are my co hosts, Hafiz, Kevin, and Fanny, and we will be discussing the right and wrong ways of getting children to obey. Welcome, everyone. Let's, you know, talk about uh, the different ways that you have used to get your children to behave, right? Uh, and also to obey, especially. Uh, some obviously have worked and some have not worked. So let's start with the uh, husband, wife, father, mother team, <laughs> Kevin and Fanny. Uh, tell us what have you tried in the past that worked or did not work and what has changed? Okay, maybe I'll go first. He's looking at me, right? Um, um I think one of the ways that I try to to uh, get our kids to comply, okay, not, not say obey, lah, to comply with what we're trying to say, or to, to, tell them to do, is I try to explain to them, I'm a bit more law so, lah, but I'll, I'll bother to explain why are we doing this and, and the reason why we're doing that kind of thing and try to break down the steps and, and, and try to give them a bit of detail on why they must, on what they must do and how, and how they can go about doing it. Lah. Yeah, so it, uh, it's a hit and miss. Sometimes they take it, sometimes they, they don't. Yeah, so, but this one way that I try lah, that to explain and to, and to tell them why. What, what's the difference between comply and obey? Uh, comply, maybe they're not willingly lah, but obey is, <laughs> they, they do it willingly. Okay, I thought they are the same. Never mind. All right, Fanny, what, what about you? Yeah, uh, so I personally, I feel that uh, it's easier when they're younger. You know, I remember sending my children to naughty corners. Uh, again, you know, there's research here and there that says, oh, maybe that's not so good or that's good. I don't know. Lah. I don't know what's the latest research right now. But back then, you know, I don't, this was 12, 10, 12 years ago. I, I did use the naughty corner. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, and I thought, oh, quite easy. You know, they're small. You know, they can't really fight me. You just put them there and then, you know, you ask them to stay there. Right? Um, so whether it's right wrong well thankfully it worked quite well for my boys for my daughter not so much because she will just daydream in the corner and then she'll be it doesn't seem to affect her very much so to be honest um uh, i think it's not so much the right or wrong it's really what works best for the individual child uh you know it's the same parents same set of parents kevin and myself but you know i realized that similar to being in organizations similar to a family setting everyone is unique so it is really tailoring to what um, kind of discipline measures will work for the child uh, and adjusting as we go along. Yeah. Yeah. Sending a child to the quiet corner for some children is like, yippee, now I'm, <laughs> I'm yeah. left alone. <laughs> yeah. yeah. How about you, Hafiz? What was your experience like? Yeah. On hindsight, uh, those methods uh, um, usually have, to me, have... Uh, sometimes have long-term consequences you know like for example if you put them to a naughty corner you're telling them that uh, it, when you misbehave you get to get out of my way all right i mean that is one message that may be received uh, rightly or wrongly so what happen is the next time uh, they just get out of your way and uh, as you said fanny it's easier when they are young you are within uh, they are within your control but once they grow up, you know, they have that tendency to get out of your way, really, you know, and uh, get out of your sight and don't come back. You know, that would be sad, you know, and uh, then you're out of control uh, over, over their behavior and uh, and over them. So, again, uh, rightly, rightly said, um, we cannot put, uh, you know, uh, one method to every child. I think we have to uh, adjust uh, and depending on the response how each child responds to a certain approach. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, I'd yeah. like to add to that as well because, um, well, it, it's very true, you know, one method may work for this kid but it may not work for the other kid. I, I think one other dimension that we also must be aware of is the, the generation as well. I guess we grow up in a generation when the parents say something, uh, we don't question one. We, we just take it. We just do it. Even though we don't like it or what, we just do it. Most of the time, we are very compliant. Most of the time, we obey, right? But nowadays, the children, this generation now, they 
they have very various ways of responding like you know some of them re uh, obey some of them question some of them rebel yeah so it, it's very different now the, the children so it, it, we also must be time, uh, aware of the times and how these children are maybe they're more informed or something but they respond differently from us to our parents yeah so there's something so while our, they work from our parents to us it might not work for us with our kids as well if we, if we apply the same method lah. so i'll be honest to confess yeah that uh so my eldest now is 12 years old like this year he's turning 12 this year uh i think i did send him to the corner like a few months ago so even <laughs> but i must uh confess that the reason why i did that is because i needed time out um i needed to calm down and uh, because i was just so annoyed and i needed i was hoping that some time apart would and allow him to sort of reflect and allow me to calm down as well uh, so sometimes i think that how do you decide what is right or wrong in terms of uh, parenting techniques or getting children to obey right uh, also stems from our motivation and uh, somehow also adjusting our expectations uh, because motivation is in like you know sometimes if it is out of anger or because we are rushing for time you know then we might actually deal a harder hand uh, but yeah expectation as well sometimes you know when we say one of uh, Parkson you mentioned about perfect children right uh, again you know if we expect our children to be like perfect actually it's very unreasonable because we are not perfect parents either uh, and sometimes we sort of want to live our dreams through our children as well so again that's also very uh, that, that's wrong <laughs> yeah yeah I, I think that's how many parents uh, view it you know i mean if i have perfect children or at least very well behaved children it reflects well on me <laughs> you know on the contrary if my children misbehave and you know are doing all kinds of vices and even worse still crime you know it does it reflects badly on their upbringing which reflects on me right you know it tells tells people or gives people the impression i'm a bad parent so that's why the pressure is there you know rightly or wrongly i think this is unnecessary pressure uh, but that if that's how they perceive it then that's how they will behave it right and they will just yeah feel the pressure to to make their children be best behaved children in the world uh, so that you know they can be proud of themselves um yeah i think the time out approach um you know it's uh, one of the dangers of the time out approach is that you know it, the child feels that love is being withdrawn by the parent you know and um okay and and of course it, it sends a message that you know this behavior is uh, unacceptable and you know needs to be corrected uh, but you no, know, Fanny, you brought up that that one about you know sending your twelve year old or going to be twelve year old son to the corner. Uh, I think it is a good example where parents sometimes need to send themselves to the quiet corner because we need to calm down, we need to soothe ourselves, yeah. uh, right? We need time out. Yeah. So I think it, it's it's. Um, I think we need to be more clear. You know, who actually needs a time out? If the parent is the one, then we just got to tell the child, right? Uh, I'm uh, I'm not. You know, I don't have the bandwidth, the capacity, the energy to deal with this right now. Okay, uh, so can you give me some some time and some space? Yeah, I think that 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 would uh, be a better way because it also teaches the children how to communicate, right? How to be assertive, to tell people how you feel, and what you need at that point of time, right? Rather than maybe taking it out on someone else. So you actually uh, said one thing. Uh, you were explaining all right um you know a parent's behavior okay so my question is how early uh, or how young or how old a child that we uh, are able to explain uh, certain approaches certain punishments certain actions taken is it is it is there a certain age or you know it's never too young for us to explain so that they understand, understand the rationale of of us doing things yeah uh definitely i think uh we the reasoning is definitely a lot more la, nowadays you know the time required to sort of uh rationalize uh but like Parkson mentioned earlier as well like we need to know ourselves so recently you know i can't remember exactly what was it i was irritated with my son uh but i knew i was tired so then uh kevin i can see that he was trying to find out where my son was coming from. So I allowed them to have the conversation and I just excused myself. Um, so yeah, it's 
definitely it has changed uh, in terms of the techniques, so to speak. Uh, but I think it's very important that we are aware of where our, you know, like bandwidth, you know, how tired are we, the weather, you know, is this out of our own anger and <laughs> or is it really that we are putting the child at the center and we really want him to learn something? Yeah, so it's, it's, good. it's usually a mix of everything. Um, so you just got to be mindful, I suppose. Yeah. I remember what that what what incident it is about playing the piano. But anyway, this is a, it's a domestic thing. Yeah. Um, but to answer you, uh, Hafiz, uh, I I think there is no uh, standard age, lah, so to speak, because or just like how the each method is different for each kid, right? The, our children also cognitive level and understanding also different, like, different, right? So sometimes our child also like sometimes they also think he also think very childishly but sometimes my 10 year old can get it or even my eight year old can get it as well so the uh, it depends on how well we explain but also depends really on their maturity lah, you know but well but one of my friends actually told me don't underestimate our kids because uh you go ahead and just explain if they get it they get it but if they don't then then in time they will lah, you know so he gave me an example of when one of the times when in the park and what his kid actually asked papa what is this he his initial thought is don't bother explaining to you because you're such a kid he he it'd be too, uh, too scientific for you but then he thought i'll just go ahead and try then he actually tried it he explained it and then the kid kind of got a little bit of it the gist of it but yeah so he was very amazed that he actually i thought if my kid wouldn't get it but when he tried it and he kid his kid actually got it so same same principle i guess so the, the children if we explain so one incident i can tell you about eating vegetables right we had to drill it in our kids when very young right just eat your vegetables yep. right yeah the veg intake kind of thing just drill it in first you don't understand just eat first you know what i mean so to a point where now they just eat their veg without complaint because it's just drilled in already kind of thing yeah whether they really understand it's good for them it's not another thing but yeah they, they get it lah. yeah i think it's a important thing to explain uh your rules and you know uh as for, from the from day one yeah uh, even if your child doesn't seem to understand like for example you know when your child is able to walk on his on his own you know one of the things you would you would tell the child uh, is you know uh, don't play by the roadside you know don't play the near the road when you cross the road you know and things like that now does the child fully understand i mean they the child might understand the words that you're saying but does he understand the dangers actually you know uh, but you have to explain it anyway right so i think it's also uh, important and useful to start this habit at least from the parents perspective is because you know if you don't have this habit uh, then the danger for the parent is to become very authoritarian right just decree you know from today onwards you know nobody is supposed to do this and that's it all right uh, and once it becomes a habit it's hard to change and when your child becomes a teenager or even a preteen, the explanation is actually the game changer all right uh okay so if you are able to explain it okay and share your rationale what what's the thought process behind it behind your decision or your rule all right and if your teenager is uh, convinced by your thought process or at least your teenager sees that you have actually used your brain <laughs> and you have you know it, it's not plucking something out of the air and something very random but you have actually thought over it maybe even agonized over it and finally you have come to this decision or this you know rule they really appreciate it okay and i want to tell you that's half the battle won now what's the second half of the battle is the compliance all right so they might they may appreciate you know and be very happy that you have actually thought about it and they might even be impressed you know wow daddy can think <laughs> you know uh but the compliance is the second story so it's, it's totally different story is the second half of the battle but it's half the battle one so i i would encourage mm -hmm. parents to get into the habit from day one to explain your decisions explain your your rules but it also you know it's also part of your developing helping your child develop these different skills all right of thinking critical thinking you know of weighing the pros and cons of communicating and also also of emotional intelligence because as you wrestle with you know certain decisions all right there are emotions involved and as you share them all right you're actually helping your child learn to be able to identify and be aware of their own emotions when they are trying to you know solve problems and make a decision for example yeah while you say all these things um and 
I, I realize that uh, I have four children, right? So I tend to uh, treat my, I mean, elder one because uh, the elder one, you know, to to mature faster because you know they have younger uh, siblings, you know. Then I realize that actually maturity on our children depends on how we treat them, right? If you want to treat them to uh, maturely, then they mature faster, and if we you know slack. Uh, on them, then they will just uh, take time to 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 feel that they are they have responsibility, right? So I think we need to be conscious, uh, regardless of the position uh, of our children. If we have more than one child, uh, we need to treat them. Um, you know, not not. I mean, it's difficult to t- treat them equally, but to be conscious that the younger one need not be given always the slack. You know, while the older one is always given the responsibility. I think. This boils down to another uh, problem that most parents have is to compare, you know, between children. You know, uh, you, your brother, your sister can do it. Why not you? And, and vice versa. Why are you not like him? Why not like her? You know, so that itself to me uh, will teach them that oh, you expect me to be uh, like him, like her. So if I be like him, are you happy? But they realize that that's not him. That's not that's not them. You see, and I think that is a problem uh, that will become a problem because uh, then. It's a deeper problem because then the identity of the person is lost again, which I think is a bigger problem. You know, one of the most common uh, methods parents use to get their children to obey uh, is rewards and punishment. I'm sure all of us have used one or both, probably both. Uh, what, what are some rewards and punishments you, you have used with your children? So when they were younger, we did like sticker charts. Um, so they would have to accomplish and but it's tailor-made uh, because some of them are good at certain things so those we don't consider effort uh, but it's an effort for someone else so then only things that require effort then we put it into you know different uh, columns once they collect everything then uh, they can either claim uh, they can either claim like a I don't know food something that they'd like to eat screen time yeah screen time uh, screen time is when they're older, la. like now, now they can, they can claim screen time. <laughs> uh, but yeah, usually it's in these two forms, uh, screen time and also food. Yeah. Mm, all right. Sweets and snacks and whatever they like. La. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Usually. Yes. Okay. How about punishments? You threaten them with punishments, you know, when you get home, you'll get it. <laughs> So there was this season, I think there was for a good two years or something, Kevin came up with this system of like rubber bands. Um, but this was to empower, because during that season, we had a helper, uh, Freta. So Freta was with us and, you know, we wanted to empower her uh, to be able to discipline our children. Uh, but again, she, she wouldn't feel very comfortable to lay on them the kind of punishment that Kevin and I would. Uh, so what we did was we already had the system before Freta. So you know when it carried on, it was actually very convenient because we tell the that you know every day it's like a three strike rule. Uh, by the third strike, then you will you will kena la. Uh, how they kena that one is you know up to us to decide lah. Don't depends on how severe things are or how angry like combination right. So then uh, actually we say like three rubber bands lah. By the third rubber, so in the day, so it gives uh Freta that kind of uh, empower you know she's like hey you don't listen to me uh, then you know you will get one rubber band so you know she will issue la so when the time we finish work and we come home then we will hear like which children got three rubber band that we will need to deal with the rest then you know if there's just one or two okay you know you're off the hook you reset for a new day yeah so <laughs> so we found yellow card red card yeah yeah that's exactly, right exactly exactly yeah and every day reset la. so they know that if i can make it to the day without getting three rubber band right then can I, then it's- when we're younger, especially they're very visual, right? So you put the rubber band there, then oh no, I only got one already, I got two already, I think. So it's very visual for them to okay, I need to toe the line at least for today, tahan, then after that, tomorrow we set again. So the rubber bands are off, kind of thing. Yeah, so it's like a red card, yellow card kind of thing, yeah, for them to. So they did work well? Yes. Yeah, pretty, pretty. So well. it helped uh, my helper to feel like, you know, she, she has that authority. Um, so not less frustrating for her. And for the kids to know that, hey, you know, don't don't play a fool <laughs> just because your parents are not around, you know. Uh, yeah, you need to toe the line. So, 
So you have a system, okay. eh? so the importance yeah. of having a system when you so delegate so called to another person, they follow the system. But that system, how long will how long did it work? I mean, we're still age? using it now. Still using now, okay. Ah, uh, yeah, right. now, but not as diligently as before. I mean, Freta left us uh, last year already. I mean, yeah, because Kevin and I, this kind of system requires enforcement. And because, <laughs> so you need to be with the children to sort of, you know, uh, but yeah, we still do it like at the end of the day, sometimes when we come back and then, you know, these guys just like, yeah, I don't know, create a ruckus uh, or uh, somehow seem to be bouncing off the walls. Then yeah, then they were like, eh. And because they're older now, we say two rubber bands now. By the second one, then you can already. So. <laughs> So, so I see the effectiveness of this system because it's like a deterrent, right? And before they really do something bad, you know, you give them a warning. So it sort of worked to, I mean, until a certain extent. So again, when until when you use this system, the system has to change if, let's say, it stops working. <laughs> so what's your what what plan do you have after this? <laughs> you thought about it? Yeah, don't don't fix what is not broken. So <laughs> it's still working. So we are sticking with it. Um, but I think we are like I, I said earlier, like we are rationalizing a lot more, like reasoning a lot more. Uh, especially with my eldest boy. Uh, and of course we understand that you know we also need to. So it's not just about punishment, right? You need to love. I mean, getting ch children to obey, they need to know that they are loved and all of that. That's why they will trust you and listen to you. And you know, as they grow older, like Parkson says. Why should they trust you when they have Google on their hands, right? Uh, why would you're no longer the source of all information? So they need to understand that they are very well loved, and so with that, and, and so I kind of brain not brainwash, but you know, sounds so horrible. But when they were younger, then I would always tell them, "Is that remember? I love you very much. So trust me, okay?" <laughs> yeah. So, um, but the system, I don't. I think it's just doing less and less with systems, so to speak. And more and more with uh, reasoning and just having conversations, uh, yeah. And also putting people, bringing people alongside, because sometimes the parents' voice might not be the only voice they want to hear. Um, so you know, my my kids are close to uh, their uncles and aunties, so then they will go and uh, spend time with them. You know, we always encourage my yeah our our siblings to sort of input into their lives basically the uncles and aunties are input into their lives and i will update them as well like the, the kids are like this um uh, and maybe they did something like this or maybe uh you know they did something well you know so then i will invite the the family to come alongside uh and and journey with them because when you build that foundation right now it's easier for them to input as they grow older so that's my strategy <laughs> so going back to that... your rubber band uh uh, system, I assume that there, there are clear and specific rules, right? Um, not not uh, very random because, uh, you know, only when they break the clear and specific rules uh, do they get a rubber band. Am I right? Uh, clear specific rules. Are, no, I mean, uh, it's, it's usually just, uh, you know, go and have lunch and, you know, listen when Auntie Freta tells you something, uh, if it's time to do your homework, you're going to do your homework kind of thing. Uh, so it's not like a set out, like, you know, they know exactly. I mean, they, they have an idea, like maybe after school, they need to come back uh, and eat lunch and then shower and do homework, you know. So they, they ask that rough guideline. Uh, we don't have a penal code, la, Parson. We don't have a penal code to say, <laughs> if you do this one, you cannot run Robin, do this one, cannot do. But usually, case by case, we will remind them also, if you, you persist in this attitude, you get a raw band. Then they get it. Like, okay, okay. You know, then they yeah. Or you okay. you are getting hot tempered now. You're you're you know, you're you are you're a bit edgy right now. You might want to uh, uh, watch your attitude before you before you continue the conversation. That uh, before you get rubber mm. So we get a warning first before we get a rubber band. It's a pre rubber band warning, so to speak. So they kind of get it a little bit. Yeah. So they get them to yeah. tell them to soft check a little bit uh. yeah. So what I'm trying to get at is that you know, um, Parents, as parents, we have too many rules and uh, we make up rules along the way. Uh, and that sometimes that confuses children. And not only that, uh, when you have too many rules, uh, it's very hard to enforce them consistently. And consistency is one of the pillars of uh, parenting, right? And so if, if you're not being consistent, then it can create confusion in the kids and sometimes even anxiety, right? Because they don't know what to expect next. So that's why I think it's, you know, I tell parents it's important to have very clear rules. Like you mentioned, Kevin, the penal code, right? Everything is written down black and white. The rules and if uh, the rules are violated or broken, 
the, the, even the consequences are spelled out very clearly. And this is what I, I would tell parents, you need to explain to the kids so they understand why. And um, you know, underneath every rule, there are actually principles and values that you want to inculcate in your children. So rules are not just for the sake of rules. Rules, there is a purpose for a rule. It's kind of a, you know, a killing two birds with one stone, all right? You're trying to get the best behavior of your kids, but at the same time, for the long run, you want to inculcate certain values or principles into them. So that the day when, you know, the, the rubber bands are no longer, you know, uh, around, uh, no, no parents are no longer around, they will still continue with that good behavior because they understand that there is a value behind it, right? And there are benefits behind it. Uh, yeah, so th that's, I think, um, what, what I would say that parents uh, should think about doing like, rather than just, uh, oh, as long as you're not obeying me when I tell you to do something, you don't, you don't do it, you know? The third time I tell you to do the same thing, you don't do it, you get one rubber band. Uh, that, that's not a very... Um, good system in that sense you know because all they all they do is they obey out of fear and to escape punishment uh, and that's what uh, people would call uh, extrinsic or external motivation so what we want to build in our children is actually the intrinsic the internal motivation doing what is right because it is right yeah your thoughts uh, office yeah definitely um I think I also have this um, experience. Uh, whenever we want them to do something, right, we tend to maybe get that at the wrong time, one thing, and then uh, we tend to repeat, okay, and repeat. I think the problem with repeating is that it becomes naggy and, uh, and they will not follow uh, whatever you say. So I think we need to sometimes be wise to uh, say things uh, in a way that uh, we'll get the attention, that's one. Uh, do not repeat the instruction. Try to get it. Make sure they follow the first time. That means if you keep repeating, they will wait for you for the tenth time. Then they will do it, and it becomes a habit. Then I think the, the one one is about um, following through. Right? So for example, even we have rewards, we have uh, punishment. Right? Sometimes we overestimate our uh, punishment level. Uh, we overdo it. We over punish or over promise you know over threatening uh, even the word threatening is bad and then we don't do it because I, I, it's not possible it's not practical so it becomes counterproductive all right so uh, again if we, we need to take it step by step and uh, make sure that every step is done uh, in a such a way that uh, it's effective I, I thought this is useful yeah fanny always reminds me that the punishment that we want to emit out must match the, the crime, lah, so to speak. Yeah, because there was a period of time when um, out of my anger, like when homework was not done, I was very teacher report homework not done, then I used the cane kind of thing. But you no know, homework and cane, you know, don't shouldn't really go together, so to speak. You know, that, that, that doesn't really match, lah, right? So we need to match the, the punishment with the with the crime. But having said that also, when we discipline our kids, so that Parkson was saying that when we send kids to naughty corner then there's a there's a there's the flip side of it is the kids may feel that we that we reject them or we push them away kind right so one of the things that we have always done after every naughty corner for example we will process them and then we allow them a chance to apologize and then we we always hug and always and always reaffirm them that we mama love you the kind of thing so we always hug after uh to release them from the naughty corner is to hug them yeah so again to just to remind them that they are loved Oh, yeah, uh, Kevin, you use the four letter word. Uh? Kane. What? Kane? <laughs> you have Kane, a Kane, huh? Uh, uh, now no more. It? It? <laughs> it's a four letter word, Kane. What were you thinking? <laughs> I thought hate. I thought you said hate. Okay, I'll, I'll censor that word out later on. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, because I used it before, but I'm very aware. All right, the cane is not supposed to be used to beat the child. I mean, I don't know then, uh, I use it as a form of deterrent again. I hang it there. In fact, the cane is such a bad shape because I usually beat the ground with something else, uh, not the child, you know? So I, I don't know, this is probably another topic for us to discuss. Yeah, but definitely we need to use the cane sparingly uh, and properly uh, and not out of anger, out of, uh, again, they will be scared of the cane, but not of the, and don't understand why they are, they, they are afraid of actually if we use too much of anything uh, as a threat or as a tool. Now, growing up, you know, we, we were 
we we cannot cane lah. We we will have cane and hanger and all that are different different uh, equipment, right? Whatever that's yeah. needed. Yeah. Um, so I remember when we had kids. I know that I felt that I only wanted to smack with my hand because I can I can the I can adjust my own strength. Because you can tell my if you smack too hard, also your hand painful, you know. So you, you kind of uh, will be more mindful of your strength level, and usually I tend to take over from Kevin because I know he's he's stronger. So I tend to wanna do the discipline and and get him to step aside, um, when it's time to punish, uh, but, so the cane for us it came it was a very interesting uh time when my sister came to visit. And then she asked me, she said, you know, uh, she brought a cane with her. And she's like, hey, I can leave it for you, you want? And that time I was dealing with my daughter. So my my boys are easier for us to sort of control, especially when she was younger. Lah. Now she's bad. She's she's definitely grown to be, you know, a very sweet uh, uh, girl. Lah. But back then, oh, I tell you, this girl is just was driving me nuts. So when my sister offers, like, you know, I can leave the cane for you, I'm like, mm, okay let's try you know it's like a deterrent but we did use it so again i confess it's like much of some confession box here right so we did use it uh uh on occasions i must say uh but like kevin said we it's, it's a different season now and um it's not something we want to use uh and hopefully yeah <laughs> we don't have to use so much that it's more to sort of threaten but like happy say also threaten also need to be very sparing as well so not easy being parents, lah. That's probably my summary. <laughs> yeah. So, Park what do you think? What, what, how do we use the cane, or should we not use the cane? Well, I just met a father uh, two weeks ago, where you know he has a fourteen-year-old son, but a uh, few years earlier, previously he was um, punishing his son for something, and so he used the cane, uh, and he was really angry, right? Um, and so, at that moment. He instead of hitting the sun with a cane, he hit himself. He hit his leg, lower leg, uh, and you know, just one time, it was so hard that he started to bleed. You know, mm -hmm. and when the son looked at it wow. and he says, "Wow, you know, that's how you know that's how much it hurt, Daddy. You know, what I've done really hurt him, and you know, he was so angry. He he didn't hit me, but he hit himself. You know, to you know, and just one one just one hit, and he was started to bleed." And he said, from that from that day on, every time the son, you know, uh, was mis misbehaving or mischievous, uh, he didn't have to even bring out the cane. All he needed to do was use his hand to, you know, rub his leg to remind the son. Remember what happened that day? <laughs> oh, that's a unique. Uh, okay. uh, now, of course, this is, this is a one on one in a million kind of story, lah. <laughs> okay, um, uh, but just to share some research, you know, latest research, and and there was more than one. Uh, Caning, spanking is actually considered, um, or it, it is as damaging to the child in terms of the mental health and, uh, you know, um, as, as um, child abuse, okay, uh, all different kinds of other childhood uh, adverse experiences, all right? So um, we should try not to use spanking, use the cane uh, at all, all right? And um, I think one thing we need to make clear to parents, and I keep repeating it, is that discipline is not the same as punishment. Uh, okay, uh, even if you go back to the root root words in Latin, uh, they are very different. Uh, punishment is punitive. Um, discipline is constructive. Uh, co discipline is to teach. Um, punishment is usually just parents' way of venting their anger and frustration. You know, they, they, they feel very inconvenienced, they feel very frustrated and they want the child to know and feel exactly how they're feeling. And so they use punishment, especially, you know, the physical kinds uh, so that the child will know this is how angry I am right now. So that, that's why it's, it's uh, bordering on child abuse. In fact, it is considered child abuse. Um, okay. And I just want to end by just um, also talking about rewards and punishment. Rewards and punishment actually uh, is known by this term called operant conditioning. Okay, O-P-E-R-A-N-T, operant conditioning. It's, it's something that was popularized by Sigmund Freud. If you have heard this name before, you know, he is a, a very weird guy, you know. <laughs> he, he says that, you know, um, human behavior, all right, can be modified, all right? And so he came up with this, this theory of rewards and punishment. And the, the experiments were actually carried out with rats and dogs. Okay, where you know they were conditioned to certain behaviors, 
And so now we have actually uh, translated that or, you know, um, transported it into parenting. So I, I was wondering, I said, are we raising, are we training dogs or are we raising children? Okay, so if you're training dogs, that's fine. You can use rewards and punishment. But if you're raising children, that's not the right way to go. Uh, so I think I just want to yeah, put it out there to, to help people understand, uh, you know, that that's where all these uh, parenting methods come from. <laughs> okay, and that's why it's important for us to unlearn those things and learn the right ways of uh, uh, teaching our children and getting them to obey. Thanks for All right, as you can see, this uh, topic is a very big one and I don't think we will ever end talking, <laughs> talking about it. Uh, yeah. But it has been fun. And so I want to thank you all for your contributions and uh, well, have a nice weekend and we'll see you in the next time. All right, see you. Thank Bye -bye. you, everybody. Thank you.